Good morning. I'll let everyone kind of start to populate here. Thank you for joining us this morning for Winship Grand Rounds. If you're an Emory University or a healthcare employee and would like to receive a CME credit hour for attending today, the login information will be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send me, Julie Hawkins, an email or drop a note in the chat box. This morning, we're excited to welcome Dr. Hugo Ertz. Dr. Ertz is the Director of Artificial Intelligence and Medicine or the AIM program at Harvard Brigham and Women's Hospital. AIM's mission is to accelerate the application of AI algorithms and medical sciences in clinical practice. This academic program centralizes AI expertise, stimulating cross-pollination among clinical and technical expertise areas and provides a common platform to address a wide range of clinical challenges. Dr. Ertz is the leader in medical AI and principal investigator on major NIH-supported efforts, including the Quantitative Imaging Network and Informatics Technology for Cancer Research initiatives for the NCI. In 2020, he was awarded a prestigious ERC Consolidator Grant of the Horizon Program for the European Union. His research has resulted in numerous peer-reviewed publications in top-tier journals. Dr. Ertz is Associate Professor at Harvard University and full professor at Maastricht University. Dr. Ertz earned his master's in engineering from Eindhoven Te Institute of Technology, his PhD from Maastricht University, and his postdoctoral fellowship from Harvard School of Public Health. Welcome, Dr. Ertz. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so in this the talk, I'm going um, uh, to highlight uh, the studies that we're doing in the field of artificial intelligence, so AI, uh, in cancer imaging, as well as related uh, topics. So, uh, you know, um, as also said in the introduction, I'm the director of the AIM program. Uh, as it is a new program, I briefly want to introduce it. So, um, it's really an academic program to accelerate AI applications in medical sciences and clinical practice. Um, and it is also housed at Mass General Brigham, uh, which is the new name of Partners Healthcare, uh, which brings uh, together investigators from uh, Brigham Women's Hospital, MGH, Dana Farber, as well as the School of uh, uh, Public Health and Medical School from Harvard. Um, and, you know, we are a very multidisciplinary research team. Um, we're about 30 to 35 people now, uh, but fastly growing. Uh, about half of them are MDs, half of them are PhDs, and, you know, we're really try to stimulate this, uh, this, this interaction uh, in this field. So in this talk, I want to first highlight or describe, you know, why do we need um, AI-based imaging biomarkers and also uh, how do we do this? Uh, so what is the technology underlying these? Then I will give you some, um, uh, show you some studies of, uh, in the applications in cancer imaging and also give you some example studies at the end. All right. So, AI, you know, a lot has been said about this uh, currently, and it's, it is still a hype, which is actually amazing. Um, but, you know, it's pretty impressive to see how AI methods currently um, start to match and even exceed um, humans for very specific tasks, right? And there's, of course, a lot of controversy, you know, can, can cars really drive themselves or not? But it's very impressive what AI technologies can do today compared to, say, a decade ago. Uh, so there's an enormous progress and uh, this will rapidly um, uh, increase likely, uh, especially with all of the big tech and all of the other, uh, the enormous efforts worldwide into this, uh, into this area. And we also expect, of course, that AI and humans will in the future work better together and can learn from each other um, to complete, to successfully uh, complete a specific task. So if you then look a little bit on um, AI technologies and medical imaging, um, which uh, this talk is more about, is that uh, I just want to briefly illustrate a little bit how, we wo how it works and what are the te technologies that we're using. So in this case, you can see an illustration of a lung cancer a nodule or lung cancer tumor. And um, we wanted to quantify different characteristics, right? We wanted to see, you know, is this nodule, for example, benign or malignant? Um, so what we used to do is that we went to pulmonologists, radiologists, oncologists and ask, you know, what kind of characteristics do you think is important here? And, you know, what, what do you think could be important for determining, uh, discriminating between, uh, say, you know, if this nodule is indeed benign or not? Um, so, you know, they give us a lot of input about, you know, the, how the shape is infiltrating into the surrounding tissue, how homogeneous or heterogeneous the tumor is. Um, a lot of different characteristics that can be potentially uh, quantified. So then we had computer scientists that implemented these methods into algorithms or implemented these, uh, tried to quantify these characteristics by algorithms. 
um, which they, you know, which took a significant amount of time. Uh, and then um, based on a specific data set and specific outcome, we would then select the right feature and, and include them into the right classification models. So now currently this is, this whole process is completely automated uh, using deep learning. So in essence, if you have enough training samples uh, to learn from, the deep learning network will figure out itself what are the best features and characteristics in these images that should be used um, for its specific classification task. Uh, so this makes it uh, that deep learning is, uh, is easier to apply if you have enough training data. Um, you can uh, faster uh, generate methods and algorithms. Uh, so this is really an accelerator of science in, the, in, in, in that sense. All right. So if you want to see, you know, how will AI impact various areas within cancer imaging? So one way to illustrate this is through the uh, clinical radiological workflow. Uh, and we, you know, we expect that from all, all the way from acquisition, um, pre-processing, uh, image-based tasks, as well as reporting and integrated diagnostics, that AI will have a very uh, strong in, uh, influence in each of these. But uh, specifically, what is uh, new to the field or relatively new is that AI can also help with image-based tasks uh, often performed by radiologists. And there, you know, we see uh, three main groups, uh, which is the first is detecting abnormalities in images. Uh, once we have detected such an abnormality, trying to characterize it, what is it, um, how big is it, um, so, uh, you know, looking at aspects like segmentation, so defining the boundaries, uh, as well as diagnosis and staging. Um, and after, of course, also monitoring a change of this abnormality over time, of course, is also going to be very important. Um, and this monitoring aspect is also something that, uh, that AI will uh, have uh, likely in, uh, a strong impact in. Another way of looking at this is uh, along uh, the, the, the cancer uh, care pathway. So you know, looking at, you know, all the way from you know, trying to predict uh, individuals that are at risk of developing cancer, uh, screening for cancer cases, uh, so then going to diagnosis, uh, prognosis risk certification, initial treatment strategy, and then uh, one, once we are there, assessing response and also see if we want to do some subsequent treatment uh, uh, applications as well. Um, and of course, in the end, follow up. So, you know, I will give you in this talk a little bit like examples of studies that we're doing in each of these areas, just to give you a flavor how AI could potentially be used um, uh, in each of these. And of course, um, um, there's a lot of data streams that we can uh, that we have access to there uh, from these patients, and uh, by doing so, we can really develop task-specific uh, models for each of these uh, that can be applied in 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 in, in, in different clinical settings. Um, so the first study I want to demonstrate, which is maybe a little bit of uh, a newer concept or difficult concept, more difficult concept to grasp. With. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do here is that from um, healthy individuals, right? So asymptomatic, healthy individuals, uh, we wanted to see if we take an x-ray, if we can quantify their biological age, right? So this is in the whole notion of that, you know, people age in different rates, right? So a 60 year old uh, can be biologically like a 70 year old or like a 50 year old. Um, and can we use an x-ray uh, without any radiological findings which are serious? Can we then use that x-ray to quantify this biological age? And by, do by doing so, better stri stratify patients in uh, risk categories. So uh, we wanted to first look at x-rays simply because it's the most commonly used diagnostic test. Uh, but also we know that there's a lot of information available about longevity and prognosis in these images that potentially could be useful. So what we did here, this study we published last year, um, we, um, so we use deep learning. Um, uh, so we uh, aim to develop and test a convolutional neural network. So it's a deep learning method to predict uh, long-term mortality from a, uh, chest radiographs. So for this, we used uh, the PLCO uh, uh, screening trial, which over 50,000 individuals were included, as well as the NLST trial with uh, almost 5,500 individuals. So um, um, we used a transfer learning approach uh, using a modified inception architecture, which is a certain model, which is often used in, um, uh, in, in, in deep learning. Um, and the, the model had only access to the, to the x-rays, so no other risk factors, including age, sex, or, uh, or others, were available. So it, the, the model was just fed an x-ray of a healthy individual and say, predict longevity, so predict survival. And um, the results were very strong, where uh, the, uh, the model outputted different risk groups, so from very low risk uh, of dying to very high risk, and an independent data of, uh, of very large data sets, both in the PLCO as well as an LST, we found a very nice risk certification of these individuals in these different groups. Um, 
Um, so this really demonstrates that, you know, your biological age quantification on an X-ray is important, right? So people can potentially, um, so we could potentially use this uh, for clinical decision making. But you also might wonder, so like, why is this really important, right? Like, what do you do with this? So in a follow-up study, uh, which was published very recently in Annals of, Annals of Internal Medicine, we actually wanted to see, can we use such a network to identify individuals at very high risk for lung cancer that should then be included into a lung uh, cancer screening program? Right? So the idea there is, is that you know, if an x-ray is taken at a hospital system for whatever reason, um, um, and say, for example, the, the, the findings are negative, so there's you know, no complications are found, that we can still assess this, this, this x-ray and say, but maybe this patient is a high risk for lung cancer screening, uh, for lung cancer, so please refer him, to a lung, uh, him or her to a lung cancer screening program. So uh, this is more like a, a opportunistic screening settings within a hospital sitting, uh, settings. Um, to, uh, to see if we can uh, improve the um, lung cancer screening um, uh, successes. So uh, we developed the model, uh, so a very similar model as before, um, in over 40,000 patients, uh, individuals that were included in the PLCO. And the network used an X-ray, age, sex, uh, and uh, whether or not it was a current smoker. And I'm using this information, we try to predict 12 year uh, probability that within the next 12 years, uh, this individual would develop uh, uh, lung cancer. And why we use these specific inputs is that because they're very commonly available on the EMR, right? So you could plug such a system automatically in that runs in the background, extracts, looks at this data, and then just flags the high risk individuals uh, in a hospital setting. Um, and we use a, a, a more technical at the last point, we used a transfer learning approach of the previous age prediction model um, for this. Um, so then, you know, we uh, looking at the results. So in the testing data sets uh, in both PLCO and LST, and they were completely uh, independent uh, and also uh, shielded during the training process, we found that uh, the, uh, by using such an approach, we could really identify high risk individuals very well. And we could do this more than Medicare lung cancer screening criteria. So we had a AOC of 76 versus 63 for Medicare. Um, and by implementing such a technique uh, at a high scale, at a large scale, we would miss uh, 30, uh, almost 30% fewer lung cancers. Um, uh, so making the screening uh, programs more efficient. So this is one way how you can say, okay, patients developing lung cancer risk, uh, sorry, at risk for developing lung cancer, um, how can we use imaging uh, methods uh, in this, for this purpose? So the next step uh, is then also in detection and diagnosis. So say, you know, we found uh, a lung, uh, so we're uh, a patient underwent uh, lung cancer screening, can we then automatically use AI to detect lung nodules uh, and then also classify them as cancer or not? Um, I think personally, one of the biggest uh, uh, steps in the field was the data science ball competition, which happened uh, in 2017. And there was an enormous amount of different groups around the world that participated in this challenge. And a lot of these groups also made their code publicly available. Um, so this was really an accelerator uh, of AI technologies in this space. And a lot of methods were uh, being evaluated and, uh, and you could really benchmark them against each other. I think building on this um, is a very nice paper, which I think, which was published by Google last year, uh, where they um, built an end-to-end -end fully automated uh, lung screening uh, network. So the network automatically detect lung nodules within, uh, within a patient, then also classify them if they're gonna be cancer or not. Uh, and by doing so, uh, the performance, um, the network was outperforming uh, radiologists uh, in this, uh, in a uh, very nice uh, prospective validation as well. So um, this is a, a very nice study that, that highlights um, the use for AI in, in screening uh, settings. Then going one step further, um, you know, we all know that lung cancer patients are, that the, the tumors of lung cancer patients are very different, right? Some are very homogeneous, other ones are very heterogeneous, some are, you know, others, some are spiky, other ones are more round and isolated. So there's a lot of radiographic characteristics which are different between, um, between patients. Um, and you know, we can, imaging can quantify this and we can use AI to extract and quantify these uh, potential differences uh, and see if they are relevant. So um, a study that we did uh, about two years ago is investigating deep learning to predict survival. So we wanted to look at the radiographic characteristics of a tumor and say, is this patient gonna live, um, what is the survival of this patient? So two year survival. Um, so for this, we use a deep learning network uh, using a 3D, three dimensional uh, CNN structure. 
Um, and then uh, we wanted to apply, uh, we developed both um, networks which could be applied for radiotherapy treated patients as well as surgical patients. And then we use a transfer learning approach between them. Um, so we have different data sets for training and, and uh, independent test data sets from different institutions uh, for each. So looking at the results, we could find a very nice certification power uh, for, for both the radiotherapy uh, treated patients as well as the surgical patients. Uh, of course, you can see that the survival differences are different because there's a big uh, stage effect, of course, there. Uh, but overall, the networks were very good in uh, determining, uh, in that sense, um, the survival of these patients and, and, and uh, extracting relevant information from these uh, tumor areas. Um, another way to display this um, are AUCs for two-year survival. Um, and what I want to demonstrate here is that the deep learning methods was outperforming uh, both clinical models as well as these older feature engineered methods, uh, as well as volume max and diameter. So there's really something in these images uh, that uh, can be extracted using AI and that can also be used uh, for, um, uh, for patient certification. And then we can look at the activation maps. Uh, so this more or less gives you an idea where the AI is looking within the image uh, to make this call if the patient is gonna have a long or short survival. Uh, and we found that, uh, of course, the tumor area is very important for this, but also the surrounding tissues outside of the tumor area are very important for this uh, predictive uh, capability. Uh, we did also some further tests in this, and we found that if we would mask the tumor area out uh, and only give that to the AI um, algorithm, that it actually performs drops. So the surrounding tumor surrounding areas are very important for, uh, for making uh, um, such predictions. So, um, Related to this, uh, we also did a study where we tried to investigate, can we really use imaging AI to create a link between this molecular diagnostics and um, uh, diagnostic imaging? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at uh, EGFR mutants, uh, KRAS mutants, as well as the double negatives, and see if we can use imaging to distinguish between them. Um, so we had an integrative analysis of uh, uh, over 760 patients with adenocarcinoma where we both had the uh, diagnostic imaging available as well as the uh, somatic mutational status. And then we applied the first analysis and we found that each of our mutants were overall more heterogeneous with a lower density and then KRAS uh, mutants were more likely to be homogeneous. And this is, uh, this is something we expected, uh, also talking to the radiologists because they say, you know, these each of our mutants, they look different. Uh, but now we also have a way how we can, quanti uh, how we can quantify this using AI. Uh, then we turned it around and we said, can we predict the tumor somatic state, uh, status uh, from uh, the imaging biomarkers? Um, and I apologize for all the bars here, but um, if you look at the, le at the left plot, um, uh, we uh, developed a radiomics model and we found uh, that the model performed uh, very well, uh, better than a simple tumor volume or maximum diameter. Uh, but then if we combine this with a clinical model, we saw that the performance really jumped up uh, to about 75 uh, area under the curve. Um, so um, we're pretty strong in predicting each of our mutants from uh, wild type, um, from each of our negative. And then from KRAS, if you look at the center plot, um, we actually performed less powerful between the, uh, although we've outperformed the, 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 the tumor volume maximum diameter measures, the radiomics, the AI models were uh, performing uh, uh, less than the clinic, uh, clinical model would. Um, what is very interesting here is that if you would look at the clean genetic subgroups about each of our mutant versus KRAS mutant, um, um, we found a very strong certification power between those. So each of our mutants really look different than the KRAS mutants, and we can also distinguish them uh, with area in the curves in the high 80s. Um, this, of course, is less clinically relevant, but uh, it is more to demonstrate that um, this double negative, so each of our negative, KRAS negative, uh, there's a lot of different pathways that are involved, which will uh, be uh, likely more similar to or each of our KRAS. Um, but if you look at this, the, the clean genetic subgroups, um, our certification power really went up. So they really are different and they, uh, they have different radiographic phenotypes. All right. So building on this, um, we also wanted to see, can we look at the biological basis of these imaging um, characteristics of tumors? Um, so we wanted to see are there connections between the radiomics data, the molecular pathways and clinical outcomes. Um, can we even use imaging data to predict this, the bi biological uh, pathway status of individual patients, um, as well as, you know, how can we use imaging data together with, uh, with genomic data and other data types to uh, improve um, outcome prediction. 
Uh, so for this, we had a discovery cohort of 600 and, uh, sorry, 262 patients uh, treated at the Moffitt Cancer Center. And we had an independent validation data set of uh, almost 90 patients that were treated in uh, Maastricht in the Netherlands. Um, and you know, it's a relatively complex uh, set, uh, bioinformatics analysis, but what we try to do is we run in the training data set, we try to see what, what, what are the main associations between the imaging data and the molecular pathways. And then we validated each in these, um, uh, each of the, the associations that we found in the independent uh, validation data set. Um, so these are the 13 modules that we uh, discovered. So these are radiomic features and pathways associations uh, there. Um, uh, and they were also independently validated in the validation data sets. Uh, we found that imaging features were associated with distinct biological processes, like immune system, uh, TGF beta, for example, Cadian clock. So there's really different features associated with different um, uh, biological, biological mechanisms. And we also found that these modules were significantly uh, associated with clinical factors like histology, survival, and stage. Um, so this really demonstrates that there's a correspondence between pathway status as well as uh, the imaging data. Uh, then um, we wanted to go one step further. We want to say, OK, uh, how can we use imaging data together with genomic and clinical uh, information to generate prognostic signatures? So we took two signatures uh, from literature. One was a genomic signature um, uh, of 17 genes that were used uh, for, to predict survival in, in lung cancer. And then we use our own radiomic signature, which was not never seen on this data that we published before. Uh, and then we uh, combine that uh, into prediction models. And what you can see here is that uh, the highest power for predicting uh, the, uh, the Gocordus index or the survival of these patients was by using the clinical genomics and radiomics data uh, together. So there was a significant additive effect uh, from using these different data types. Um, all right, so then we also did a prognostic pathologic validation. So we went back to the, the patients, uh, to the slides for the patients that were uh, treated at Moffitt. Um, and we found a radiomics biomarker, so an imaging biomarker that could predict uh, high and low immune response cases. And we did this, uh, we also stained these uh, for CD3 and we found uh, um, that also they were significantly different between them. Um, so this really demonstrates the link between uh, imaging characteristics as well as underlying pathology um, and biology in that sense. All right. Um, so to drill further into this, uh, we're also working together with uh, the Tracer X, Tracer X team from Charlie Swanton uh, in uh, the Crick Institute in, in London in the United Kingdom. Um, and what he's doing is he's, um, he's uh, uh, from surgical patients, they take out the specimens and he's doing a very comprehensive uh, intratumor uh, quantification of these, um, of these tumors. So they sample multiple regions within the tumors and they do um, a very comprehensive biological characterization of each of these different samples. Um, so, then that, so the thing is, is that for each patient, we'll have a very detailed quantification of this biological uh, intratumor heterogeneity. Uh, and what we're analyzing is that how can we use imaging data to predict um, this uh, ITH, um, this intertumor heterogeneity uh, and genomic patterns in these patients. Um, first results are very promising uh, that we can actually, there's a very strong link and um, although I cannot show them yet, but um, it's, it looks that there's a very strong link between the imaging phenotype and the biological heterogeneity. Uh, also linked to this, we are also looking at how can we use imaging data to really, together with CT, um, uh, CT, uh, with, uh, um, uh, with blood-based biomarkers and combine them and see if we can better track cancer patients over time. And this is more, you know, these methods are both non-invasive, so potentially there could be complementary value there. Um, and we're doing this again in the same TracerX cohort um, that's being generated in the United Kingdom. Um, Similar to this, we also wanted to see um, how can we, can we use imaging AI biomarkers to predict immunotherapy response. Um, so there we looked at over a thousand uh, lesions from uh, uh, 203 patients with advanced melanoma and non small cell lung cancer that were treated with NIVO. Um, and we wanted to see, can we predict on a lesion level if the specific cancer lesion in the lungs or other sites, for example, would respond to immunotherapy, but also can we combine that information and predict on a patient level um, the response to immunotherapy. And um, so we published this last year. Um, and there we can, uh, so these are the lesion-based predictions, and I apologize for all the bars, but the most important information there is, is that we could significantly use radiomics, so these imaging biomarkers, 
uh, to predict if a lesion would respond uh, to uh, immunotherapy. Uh, we could do this better than simple looking at the volume of a lesion. So, um, of course, we know that it's also associated, but uh, imaging, there's more uh, information in the radiographic phenotype that can be used for this. Then once we take this and we try to predict response, uh, at first follow-up and also uh, at, uh, uh, overall survival, we find a very strong predictive performance for both um, the non-small cell lung cancer uh, patients, primary non-small cell lung cancer and the primary lung cancer patients. Um, so in this sense, we can really use imaging biomarkers to predict if a, a patient is going to be responding to immunotherapy or not. Um, so this is about predicting response. So of course, we can also use AI to, um, to improve the monitoring of, um, um, of cancer patients, of cancer lesions. So what is illustrated here are three different uh, patients. Um, and there's a pretreatment scan as well as the first, second, and third follow-up scan. Uh, and these are patients that were treated with radiotherapy. Um, and then what we did is we gave um, the tumor areas, we gave that to uh, a deep learning network uh, and to see if we can use a single time point as well as multiple time points um, information to predict um, uh, clinical outcomes, um, uh, such as overall survival as well as uh, progression-free survival. Um, we used uh, a combination of a CNN versus RNN network for this. So uh, the CNN could quantify each time point individually, and then the RNN would combine the different time points together. Um, it also allows us, uh, although there's different architectures that can do this, but uh, this deep learning network allowed us to uh, also use um, data for, if there's missing data, for example, if the time point was not there for, for a specific patient, because that is also the reality uh, of the clinic. Um, and then we could fit this network to predict uh, these different clinical outcomes. Um, and what you can see here is that, uh, which is not surprising, is that by adding more information to the, uh, more follow-up information to the, to the network, that the predictions for uh, survival became better and better. Uh, and it's also important to mention that um, uh, these were better than a single time point alone. So in that sense, it's really value in combining multiple follow-up scans uh, and giving that information to a deep learning network um, to, to assess um, uh, outcomes. Um, of course, there's also a lot of other information that we can extract uh, from a CT scan uh, outside of the tumor area with, uh, from cancer patients, which could be uh, important for uh, risk certification. So we uh, used uh, AI to predict cardiovascular risk from CT scans. Um, so we looked at uh, coronary artery calcification, so CAC. Uh, so CAC is uh, the most well-known uh, well predictor for cardiovascular events. Um, the nice thing is also it can guide primary prevention therapy. So it's actionable. So you can do something with this information. Uh, but also, also very interesting is, is that it is visible over almost every uh, chest CT scan, but it requires uh, expertise and special equipment uh, to manually extract that information. So therefore, although that information is contained in a lot of uh, uh, images of patients, it's not routinely quantified uh, at a very large scale uh, manner. So we wanted to develop a deep learning system to fully automatically do this, right? So we don't need any humans to look at the scans anymore. Um, and the network used several steps in this. So uh, within the image, we first localized the heart. Then we, once we found the heart, we segmented the heart in uh, very much in high detail and, and high resolution. Then we look at the coronary arteries and then quantify the, if there's calcium there or not. And from this, we generate uh, a coronary artery calcium score, which is a risk score, the Agassiz score, which is widely used uh, and established in the clinic already. So the nice thing is, is that this whole system was fully automated uh, and could do this under two seconds on a, a more or less standard uh, GPU cluster. Um, and the nice thing is such a system will allow to identify high risk individuals for cardiovascular disease or for CVD in both organized and opportunistic uh, screening settings. Um, so for training uh, these cohorts, uh, we used, uh, for training the algorithm, we use a cohort of over 1600 individuals from the Framingham Heart Study. Um, this is an asymptomatic uh, community dwelling population, uh, which were imaged in the town of Framingham in Massachusetts. Um, and we had very high quality cardiac gated CTs available for all of these. Then we had cardiovascular radiologists segmenting all of the coronary calcium, and then we could use that for training the network. And again, we have these four steps from localization, segmentation, uh, calcium segmentation, and then uh, risk prediction uh, that were included into this algorithm for the development. 
Then we apply this network to in a, uh, independent test cohorts of over and totaling over 20,000 individuals um, of uh, individuals um, that are both asymptomatic as well as symptomatic. Um, so we used one asymptomatic cohort was the framing heart study, uh, the second imaging round that was performed, uh, as well as the analyst T data, so the national lung screening trial data. Um, where we had 15,000 individuals, um, data of 15,000 individuals available. Um, but also we had symptomatic patients of patients that were with stable chest pain in PROMIS, as well as acute chest pain in the Romicat trials. Um, so looking at the results, um, we found very high agreements between the deep learning algorithm uh, and um, expert reader uh, assessments. Uh, so we had access to five and a half thousand uh, subjects where we had manual expert reads um, and we found a very high correspondence between uh, both the deep learning network and the, and, the, and the humans. And then looking at this, the results also for predicting cardiovascular events, and I think for this audience, potentially the NLST results are the most interesting, we found a very strong stratification power from uh, very low risk to very high risk. So very low risk, no calcium to very high risk, a lot of calcium. And you can see here that um, in the NLST patients, so healthy individuals that are eligible for lung cancer screening, we can see a very nice risk certification of a high risk group. And what is also important to mention here is that the high risk group, um, um, uh, which you can see in the uh, uh, pink, pinkish curve, um, is a very large risk group. There's over th uh, uh, 3,300 individuals in this group. So it's a very significant portion of patients have this, uh, this high risk uh, for uh, CVD. Um, and, uh, our, and this is also associated with overall survival. Um, and this is not a completely fair comparison, but I still want to show it, is that if you then compare this to the analysts, uh, the lung rats, so the, the lung nodule categories which are based on NLST, you could see a very similar um, certification there uh, for survival. So this, in some ways, um, uh, can, can allude to that it is as important to look at the heart than it is to look at the lungs for patients undergoing uh, lung cancer screening. What is also important to mention here is that because the network was fully automatic, um, we could do this analysis in days, right? If we would have radiologists trying to segment 15,000 um, CT scans and quantify this Agassiz risk score, that would be, you know, that would take us years for a single person, right? Or even if you have an army, it will take a very long time. So the nice thing now is with AI, um, we, by automating um, tasks, which also can be done by humans, uh, but by automating this, we can apply them to a much larger scale than we could ever do before. Uh, and this, in this way, we still also see AI as an accelerator of science um, in that way. Um, other characteristics uh, that are also important, of course, is looking at body composition measures. Um, so looking at the L3 in a CT, uh, what are the fat and muscle uh, distributions of a patient and quantifying these and seeing uh, how they are associated with the fitness and also with outcomes of patients. Um, so there we also develop an automated uh, network uh, that selects automatically first the slice, the L3 slice. And once we found that, then segments on that slice, uh, the, uh, the different uh, comp composition measures. Um, and we wanted to then to see how important is this in uh, lung cancer patients. So um, for training, we, um, we developed um, the, um, we had over 1,100 patients that were used for training from uh, Mass General and, uh, and uh, Brigham, uh, and they, we give a raw output, meaning what is the surface area for fat and for muscle mass in these patients. What we then did is pretty interesting, is that we went to an outpatient population of over 12,000 patients, of patients that just got a scan for different reasons. And the idea there is, is that because we now have an automated method, by applying that to such a large outpatient population, we can get a general idea as to what are the distributions of patients presenting or more or less healthy patients and uh, presenting themselves at, uh, at uh, Mass General. And we can normalize, we can um, use this then for the, if you have these distributions, we can then normalize any other uh, patient to these distributions. So the nice thing is that we can also have these normalized uh, outputs for, based on age, um, sex and race, which allows us to do more comprehensive analysis. So both of these uh, inputs we used um, we then went to the Boston Lung Cancer Cohort Study, which is a study uh, uh, also within the Harvard Hospitals for the lung cancer cases. And then we, um, 
we had uh, over 1,700 patients uh, and four, over 4,000 scans for these patients with confirmed lung cancer. Then we wanted to do a distribution analysis of how do they present themselves. Uh, if a lung cancer patient comes to a physician, you know, what, is, what are the distributions and, and does it change by stage, for example, and gender. Uh, but also the nice thing is uh, because we have this normalized value, we can do survival analysis in uh, the vast majority of these. Uh, also by assessing age and stage as well as histology type. Um, so here you can really see that, you know, by, we could analyze, um, I think in total over 1700, um, 17,000 scans of patients. And we can do this very rapidly because we have a full, fully automated technique that can, uh, that, that can be applied to this. Uh, some results here, because it's still ongoing work, uh, we found um, uh, strong associations uh, with, for both muscle mass as well as fat uh, in these lung cancer patients um, for survival and BMI uh, shown in C uh, didn't show a significant uh, difference in these patients. Uh, again, demonstrating that, uh, that these body composition matter measures are important uh, for survival. All right. Um, so the last thing I wanna mention is, uh, is this. So in AI, um, there's an enormous um, amount of new publications being published every, uh, every month. Um, and uh, even uh, two years ago in science, it was a very nice editorial about um, the problem of this reproducibility. So uh, there's a large number of studies which are being published and not very often the code is being uh, released to the public. Um, sometimes there's test data uh, and uh, if we're lucky, there's some pseudo codes, which is uh, more or less like a detailed methods description. Um, so this is a, a pretty big problem in the field, uh, and I think the AI field is not as far as, for example, the genomics or bioinformatics uh, field. Uh, and we also wrote a, a position paper about this, uh, matters of rising paper in Nature, which was released two, two weeks ago, um, about uh, why we need to go to more transparent and reproducible uh, AI research. Uh, and again, we can learn a lot, I think, from other fields in the bioinformatics and genomics community, where almost all the data and methods are being shared uh, publicly. Um, it's very difficult to even publish a paper without sharing uh, code and, and data. Um, but this really accelerated and made the genomics field as mature as it is now. Um, and we used, for this, we used uh, a study from Google, uh, which had very nice results in using AI to uh, predict on mammograms um, um, breast cancer incidents. Uh, but uh, because there was not a very detailed description about the methods or uh, no code was shared, it was very difficult to see what they actually did uh, or even try to reproduce their findings. Um, to address this to some extent, uh, we started a new initiative, uh, we called it modelhub.ai. Um, so we um, try to develop an, a technical platform uh, to predict, uh, to have containerized models um, uh, that we can easily port from one, uh, from, uh, one platform, one environment to the other, so that we can share to the, to the community uh, and that they can, uh, without any major problems, quickly can get these models up and running. Um, so, you know, it's so several components. It's you know, open source, of course. Uh, it can work with any deep learning tool there. Uh, it can run on a smartphone, smartphone as well as uh, on a cluster uh, or on your own laptop. Um, and without for this audience, I want to go too much into technical details, but um, it, is the, uh, it is a platform for sharing the models to the public and also making sure that they're being adapted. And there's different ways how people can interact with these. All right, that is it. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ertz. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. While we wait on questions, please plan to tune in next week as our grand round speaker will be Dr. Bill Liu, who will be presenting on biology and the path to clinical translation of flash radiation therapy. To view all upcoming Winship Grand Rounds lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center website or the Winship calendar. Uh, we're going to welcome Dr. Shim, who's going to help us with our Q&A. So please drop your questions in the Q&A box. Dr. Shim. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I have only one question. And please type your question in Q&A uh, icon. Uh, so the question from Dr. Waller, uh, thanks for the talk. How can you open the black box of neural networks to extract actionable rules, algorithms for analysis of radiographs that can be transferred to human radiologists? Yes, so that is a great question. And this is a, um, 
this is, you know, this is a major hurdle in the fields, right? Because these networks are extremely complex. They're very nonlinear. Um, so it's not very easy to understand how your input image, for example, changes, how then your prediction, your output uh, will be influenced by this. Um, so there's several ways how we can uh, interrogate this black box um, by uh, looking at these activation maps, for example. So where is the AI looking um, to make its prediction? Uh, that's one way of doing this. Uh, other, you know, others we can you know look at different nodes and see what, what what are the most important ones, and then also simplify these networks to only use these nodes, and then uh, uh, have a slightly better idea what is what is happening internally. Um, another way of doing this is looking at large data sets uh, that that the network was applied to, look at the outliers uh, of the predictions. Uh, so sometimes the predictions are completely off from the rest. Is this due to an imaging artifact? If, what is the reason for this? Um, why is it uh, making that decision? Uh, so there's several ways how we can um, uh, estimate this. But yes, this is a major problem. It's not uh, as simple to understand as a very simple nomogram or linear model. These models are very complex. Um, and um, we, can, um, we can guess as why they're working, uh, but we don't know exactly uh, in every instance how it will. Um, having said that, uh, I'm a strong believer of like, uh, if the thing works, the thing works, right? So if we can get independently validate this, this network that it works, um, then it works. Um, like, you know, a self-driving car, you don't really need to understand why and what it's doing, uh, the AI algorithm, as long as it never crashes into somebody, it's probably a good thing, right? Um, so in that sense, I think um, by applying this perspectively in clinical trials, building up the trust also uh, towards the radiologist, um, uh, as well as other clinicians that are potentially using this, uh, I think this is a very major factor. So um, I'm also a strong um, believer that how more complex a network is, is that the more stringent and maybe more evidence is needed prospectively to say that these, these networks are uh, actually safe to use. Um, yes. Oh, okay. And um, I have some question while waiting for others to uh, write their question. So uh, for your segmentation algorithm automated, do you ever feel that somebody needs to manually edit? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, um, and I didn't show you yet, but we also do a lot of work in the radiation oncology fields where we um, use AI to automatically detect, for example, lung cancer lesions, uh, tumors, and segment these. Um, so it's very interesting because, you know, then you have different radiation oncologists um, um, working, uh, uh, working with this and they, actually have slight different preferences, right? Some, some like it more tighter, other ones that like to, to, to delineate it a little bit broader. Uh, sometimes the algorithm also completely misses it. Um, I would say that how we, I see it now uh, with the current uh, algorithms that we are applying is that in 95% of the cases of the lung cancer cases, we outperform senior residents in their, in their radiation program in segmenting, um, or we match or outperform them. Uh, but in 5% of the cases, uh, we completely fail or it fails, it is less. Um, the nice thing is with segmentation is, is that we can provide this beforehand to a radiation oncologist or uh, a dosimetrist, uh, and they then can edit these segmentations themselves. So there's always a quality check from uh, a human that will be performed. And the most important thing there is, is that uh, will such methods make their workflow faster uh, right, so they need to spend less time on segmenting the tumors in every slice, as well as making will they make them more accurate? And this accuracy is, of course, a very big debate. Um, but I, uh, but also making them more similar. Um, and I think uh, a lot of methods will be introduced there. An enormous amount of methods will be introduced within the next decades. I think it, 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 it th th that aspect of radiotherapy will be automated uh, to a very high extent very quickly. Um, yeah. Okay, so a question from a BME student. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, great talk. Uh, Model Hub looks like a great effort to share these models between researchers. What are some of the hurdles to house some of these models in software that clinicians can use on their own images in clinical workflow? Yeah, that, that is also a great question. So. So we, um, so the idea is about Model Hub is that we standardize the way we um, we we store and we run these uh, deep learning models, right? So see it as a container, like a Docker container, right? 
So then we can take that container and we can move it, for example, to a clinical system, which we often now do. So in our program, uh, every model that comes out that we are, you know, that is uh, a resulting model, which is final for publication or for clinical use, we put this into this model of formats and then we run it into uh, clinical settings. So for example, we have a heart segmentation model that we used. Uh, we are now running a prospective clinical trial evaluating this um, uh, in, in clinical systems, both in radiation oncology and radiology. So the thing though is, is that the thing maybe works very well for research settings. And if it goes wrong once every hundred times, it doesn't really matter, right? So, you know, because you can just restart your Python or whatever. Um, in the clinic, of course, you know, when there's a time pressure that the patient needs to be treated, that is completely different, right? So your level of stability uh, as well as uh, performance uh, robustness needs to be very, very high. Uh, and that is something that we're running uh, up against. So, you know, sometimes, you know, for whatever reason, you know, there's a dicom tag uh, in the image, which is different from all the other ones we saw, and the algorithm fails, then we need the engineers to come immediately work on this uh, to solve that problem. Um, so um, we also see this more like these are first steps to evaluate them, to do prospective trials, to demonstrate this. But I think then the next step is to take them to a much higher level of stability and robustness before clinical application can be uh, expected. So is there any strategy that you can compete with others because you're not going to be the only team working on the same problem? So let's say the, you develop the algorithm, there are a lot of competitions. How can you move ahead? What's the strategy? Do you have one? No, no, yeah. So um, I think, you know, we saw a lot there because, you know, there's a great, you know, there's so many groups around the world that are working on AI um, and also working on very similar problems. Um, uh, although the, the medical fields and, you know, there's so many problems that can be solved. Um, there's a lot of similarities there. Um, you know, I am a very, very big supporter of, you know, sharing all the methods and sharing as much data as you can, um, because we really see that, you know, the groups that did a, uh, that developed a method and that really works and they put this to the community and then hope that the community adopts that method also in their own analyses. Uh, we see that these groups get much more visibility, uh, these research groups. And also, um, so this also helps you, you know, for, uh, for, for your own team to say like that. Um, one thing that I'm, you know, um, what, what you now see is a little bit of everybody creates his own precious uh, algorithm and they're afraid to share this, which I get because you worked a very long time on this. Uh, but I see it a little bit as, as you know, our, as our community uh, uh, duty to share all our methods uh, as much as we can, at least with the, with the public. Um, so in that sense, you know, um, there's a lot of public data sets, of course, available, uh, which uh, in a lot of ways you have to be fast uh, because there's other groups working on this, right? If you do something in NLST, you know that uh, there's hundreds of other groups around the world working on this. Um, so we always try to have a nice balance between we have private data sets at uh, Mass General Brigham that we use at Harvard and then other ones that are more public. Uh, and we, you know, we by combining them, uh, do bigger analyses and hope uh, that we are a little bit more competitive than with, with other research groups. Um, but in, in a general sense, I think it's great that there's so much interest in this. And I think it's also really great uh, that, uh, that there's so much competition because that keeps everybody uh, at, at, uh, working the hardest. Okay. Uh, next question is from Dr. Lawson. Uh, can you use AI to detect changes from after treatment that are predictive of response? Yes. Um, that is, so, yeah, so yes, we can, right? Uh, depends. Uh, so we could potentially use AI to track a tumor um, volume over time, right? So is this tumor shrinking over time during treatment? Uh, or, uh, and then you can use, and there's a very big study from, that's led by Larry Schwartz, uh, the Volpac study, is then looking at volumetric changes over time and looking at these growth kinetic models, if, there's a, if you very early on can predict if it's gonna be a responder uh, or not. Um, so AI could help there to automatically identify the lesions, segment them, and then track them over time, and then do volumetric quantification. So that's one aspect. So and we know that if a tumor is shrinking, you know, it's working, right? Um, or it's more likely to be working. Um, but also we can use the radiographic characteristics uh, to say, for example, immunotherapy, you know, is this a pseudo progression or a real progression? Uh, so there's a lot of ways how we can uh, distinguish this. And this is something that we actually see is that um, in um, immunotherapy, uh, we can go beyond a volumetric change in predicting response uh, to treatments. So there's a different ways how AI and imaging biomarkers can be used there. Um, 
uh, both at baseline as well as using the first follow-up scans uh, early into treatment. Uh, so along the same question uh, in the chat box, uh, similar to the Lawson question, uh, can you predict for oligo progression of say a, a dominant lesion in metastatic cancer? Um, we didn't look into it, but I, if I'm right, there is a study out there that, that looked into this. I think it was a smaller study, um, but I think it is feasible. Uh, but I, I never looked into this, so I don't know myself, um, and I, I don't know the result. Okay, uh, the next question. Thank you for the fantastic seminar. In your studies, have you combined AI predictions with human assessments? What is the potential to improve on the performance of AI by overlaying human elements? Yes, um, so we did for one study um, where we, we want to see this longevity, right? Like we have an x-ray, can a human, because radiologists are, you know, if you're used to looking at these x-rays, can they also predict the longevity of, a, of, a, um, of, of an individual? And the interesting thing there is, is that um, we almost had to demonstrate that a human can also do this, right? So it's the other way around now, uh, apparently. Um, so, you know, yes, we can. Uh, the results are currently on a submission. Um, and we saw that the prediction of, of humans versus uh, the AI were very similar. Uh, the performance overall was not significantly different. Um, so we also tried to combine it, but we didn't see an additive effect by combining a human prediction with an AI prediction. Um, but um, yes, you know, humans, we are also good in a lot of ways. The downside, of course, is that to do such an ass assessment um, that required a radiologist to look about 15 minutes at a scan, uh, which of course uh, is not that long, but still, if you need to do this for every x-ray that's taken additional to the other um, uh, clinical examinations, this is of course also costly. So by AI can make it cheaper and faster, um, um, but not, not necessarily better. Okay, a question from uh, a BME student. Uh, these models do a fantastic job in predicting overall survival. While overall survival is very useful to know, uh, are th these efforts to use these predictions to influence treatment or changes in treatment on the fly? Yeah. Yes, th th this is also a very nice question. So, you know, we always try to predict overall survival, right? Uh, to demonstrate clinical relevance, but how, what do you really actually do with this, right? It's, it, it's not actionable in, in the vast majority of cases. Um, so that is also why um, I think why, I like, why also we did that study is to demonstrate there's something there. There's something in the image, in the radiographic characteristics of a tumor that AI can extract and that can be used uh, to stratify patients and risk groups. Um, uh, but it's a proof of principle, not more than that, right? Uh, but then I think for other applications like the immunotherapy response, where there's a big need, right? This is a very expensive treatment, it's potentially toxic. Um, if at baseline, so before start, we can predict better who's gonna be responding to immunotherapy or not, that can have an enormous um, clinical impact. Um, and, uh, you know, of course it really matters, you know, is it a first line, second line, you know, like, you know, all of these things, uh, you know, makes it very complex, but still there, you know, we could, there could be a very big um, clinical impact point. And that is something that um, we are focusing more on now is that where can you use these imaging mark markers for direct clinical decision? And then the big question is, is that how will uh, oncologists use this, right? So say the biomarker, um, um, I think there's two ways of integrating this. So one, um, we say, uh, we have an, um, a patient that is, allegedly, that is eligible currently for immunotherapy, right? But the biomarker says with a very high confidence, this patient will not respond to it. Then we could potentially uh, withhold therapy for that patient. But again, the biomarker needs to really, really work well. Uh, so that's a little bit a less likely scenario. I think it's actually the other way around, which will be more interesting is that for patients who's currently not eligible for immunotherapy, can, we, uh, uh, can the imaging biomarker be used to include a patient uh, into, uh, uh, to, because we have a high confidence actually immunotherapy will work, can that, that patient also uh, get, receive immunotherapy? So in that scenario, you know, you're giving more immunotherapy to patients that potentially benefit from it, uh, and you're not withholding this potential uh, uh, treatment for patients. Um, so that these are the different clinical uh, ways how we, they, they, these methods can be implemented. Okay, uh, 
I see one more question from our neuroradiologist, Dr. Weinberg. How do we get these tools to a clinical environment? Um, so, um, getting them into the environment is actually not that difficult. Uh, you know, we are, we are implementing these in clinical systems in, in the radiology uh, back system as well as in the uh, radiation oncology. Um, but getting them to really work very well to a clinical grade, that is very, very difficult. Um, so we as an academic program, we always say, you know, we, we almost stop at a prospective trial evaluating them. Uh, and then we actually share them to the, to, the, to, the, to the public so everybody can then implement them. Every company can potentially work with them. But I think it should be... Um, it should not be academic centers uh, that take that next step from we have an algorithm and we bring it into a clinical uh, with supports, uh, you know, ensuring robustness, all of these things, um, at a clinical level. Uh, I expect that um, uh, the big companies uh, like Philips uh, and, uh, and GE and, and, and Siemens, they will provide a lot of these solutions with, in the next coming years that are working very robustly. Uh, I think actually then for the field, again, there's a big need to prospectively validate all of these methods and make sure that they're actually working better and that they, you know, save costs or time or uh, improve uh, the clinical workflow in whatever way. But I think these clinical investigations are going to be very crucial uh, because I expect there's going to be a massive influx of AI technologies and a lot of them probably don't really work. And then um, actually this will hurt the field and could potentially hurt the field in the long run. Okay. I see another question coming from Dr. Lawson. In some areas of AI, there is a concern about uh, implicit bias in the people who write the program. Uh, might there be biases in the things you measure and don't measure that could affect the outcomes? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. There's gonna be a lot of biases in these algorithms. Um, you know, all the, you know, for example, looking at ethnicity, right? At, uh, at Mass General Brigham, you know, there's, there's a very white population. Uh, so how do we ensure that the, the, these methods also work uh, in other places? Uh, so that's one. Two, so the data can be different. So it can be slightly different per different institution. Uh, then there's also biases indeed the methods that are being used, uh, even how you write your code uh, will matter. Um, so um, um, then also there will be biases potentially in, in imaging uh, settings and, and, and such. So there's a lot of different ways how um, uh, these, the, 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 the performance will be, can be influenced uh, of these models. And I think the only way to really uh, uh, make sure it always works is by very multi-center, very well-designed uh, prospective mm -hmm. clinical trials, um, or at least in prospective clinical settings, but always it has to be a trial. But. Um, I think that's the only way to, to, to circumvent that. Okay, so last question, real last question. In anticip anticipation of applying the AI techniques in clinical practice, are you pursuing FDA approval? Um, so within our AIM program, we don't. Um, so we are an academic program, so our out, uh, output is publications and seminars and such. Um, and as we also share to, uh, our methods uh, as much as we can to the community. Um, um, so we are not um, pursuing for any of our tools FDA approval there. Um, having said that, we, some of them potentially could be, um, but we always think, you know, like the method that's developed in the lab is often only 80% there. And to get it to 100%, that is almost double the investment um, uh, of time and energy and money to get that to the next level, which is not something that an academic uh, group should do. Um, so that is something that uh, potential startups or um, you know, licensing with uh, the big vendors could, uh, could work with. Um, and then the big question is, of course, you know, how does the FDA look at this, um, especially with these continuously changing models? Uh, and you know, there's a, a large discussion about this. And um, it's really nice to see also the FDA um, uh, having um, um, have a much better idea about how they want to do this uh, compared to a couple of years ago. So for those programs, do you open source as well or do you have to keep closed to pursue commercialization? Yeah, so we, we make everything, every publication, we try to make it public um, and make our, our code uh, public. So then potentially another co a company could come to take that and try to commercialize it. Um, I think, you know, for 
um, a company, it's probably less interesting to make it public, uh, to make their matters public, and they probably will patent it or keep it a trade secret and then try to go for um, uh, chemical integration adoption by FDA approval. Okay, uh, so this concludes today's uh, grand rounds and thank you for the exciting talk and great discussion. Thank you everybody thank you. for attending. <laughs> thank you.